welcome to the webinar on youth employment laws. I'm Katie Sieverding, Government Relations Coordinator for the South Dakota Retailers Association. Before we get started, I have a little information about our association. We are a 4,000 member statewide association, and we represent retailers in the legislative and regulatory process. We also provide information, offer training for food service and alcohol licensees, and provide member services which include credit card processing, business insurance, and data security. In addition, we have an agreement with a labor law firm that offers our members to get answers to employment law questions from an attorney. Today's webinar will feature a presentation by Tom Hart. He is the Deputy Secretary of the South Dakota Labor and Regulation and oversees the Division of Labor and Management. A native of Miller, South Dakota, Tom graduated from the University of South Dakota School of Law. Prior to joining the Department of Labor and Regulation, he practiced law in Sioux Falls and Pierre. Just a few things before we start the presentation. We have a note-taking version of the PowerPoint that can be printed from the handouts area on the side of your screen. All of your phones will be muted, so we won't be hearing any background noises. After the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question at any time, just go to the panel on the side of your screen. There's an orange arrow that you may need to, to click to maximize that panel. Type your message in the chat box and click on send. At the conclusion, conclusion of the presentation, I'll read the questions out, lo out loud and Tom will provide the answers. I will now turn over the presentation to Tom. Good, or good morning. I first want to state thank you to the South Dakota retailers for allowing the South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation Division of Labor and Management to present today. We have quite a few topics to go over, so let's dive right in. A little background on the Division of Labor and Management. Uh, we are responsible for administering the state labor laws. Our mission is to provide responsive dispute resolution and help through investigations, enforcement, compliance, and education of workforce and discrimination laws. Um, while today's presentation is gonna be limited to discussion on work comp insurance um, and youth labor laws. We also oversee uh, workers comp, labor negotiations, mediations, and fact finding. Uh, we oversee the UI, which is the unemployment insurance ALJ appeals process. We also have the division of human rights and the wage and hour div uh, division. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, so today's discussion um, is gonna be the Fair Labor Standard Act. Uh, work comp insurance and the student learner program. Um, before we begin, a couple ground rules. Uh, we're gonna be discussing quite a bit about two different sets of laws. Uh, the Fair Labor Standard Act is actually a federal uh, regulation. We at Division of Labor and Management do not enforce, nor do we provide um, legal advice uh, on the Fair Labor Standard Act. That's a federal uh, regulation, but we can provide some guidance uh, to our constituents in South Dakota on the same, because there is some crossover between state labor law and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, so let's jump right in. First thing I wanted to just let you know, um, there's two sets of minimum wages. There's a FLSA minimum wage, which is $7.25. Um, that's on the federal level, but every employer in South Dakota um, has a state minimum wage, um, which as of January 1st of 2018 is 8.85 an hour. Um, there is an opportunity wage. Um, uh, businesses can pay anyone that is under the age of 20, 4.25 per hour for the first 90 calendar days um, of employment. Um, that is a one-time usage. Um, you can't use it continuous summers. And the 90 days start on the first day of work um, it doesn't mean 90 actual working days. It's from when they start and then the 90 day calendar stops um, or until they er, uh, reach the age of 20 years of age. We also have the tip credit um, for employees that traditionally also earn tips. And that is typically if they earn $30 or more a month in tips, the employer can um, ha uh, request the tip credit they have to pay 50% of minimum wage, which is $4.42.5 per hour. And then the tips um, that the employee earns has to meet 885. 
If it does not, then the employer has to make up the difference to get to that 885. Another thing that we get a lot is deductions. Um, we get questions about deductions. Deductions are fine um, as long as they don't drop uh, the person's wage below minimum wage. Um, even if that's for property damage, cash register shortages, they haven't returned work tools, you can deduct for that. But if you take them below minimum wage, you're going to have to get take that to civil court um, or, or a criminal court. Um, you have to at least pay a minimum wage. Um, the other question we get a lot is training. A lot of employers have uh, training maybe the first day before work officially begins. If it's any type of training where it's not voluntary attendance and it is also part of learning about their occupation, position, or job, that training um, must be paid by the employer. Over time, FLSA, again, is time and a half on a 40-hour work week. It's not per pay period. It's a work week. So if you're a two-week pay period, employee earns or works 42 hours one week and 38 hours the next week for 80 hours during the work pay period. They are entitled to overtime uh, for the first week where they worked over two, uh, 40 hours. Um, another note. South Dakota, we do not have overtime requirements. So this overtime is only required if you are what's considered an FLSA covered employer. And we will get into that in a few more slides. So um, the next slide is how do you determine which laws to follow? Every employer that's in South Dakota must follow, this, follow the South Dakota labor laws. but if you also have over $500,000 in sales or your employees or your business deals in interstate commerce, you also have to follow the FLSA, the federal regulations. Interstate commerce, it's pretty easy to um, get involved in interstate commerce. The feds have determined that even if the employee does phone calls, uses the phone, and that phone call crosses state lines, that's dealing in interstate commerce. If they do ordering for you, sending mail, invoices, um, you put your goods in the stream of interstate commerce, um, you would be, um, that employee specifically be covered by the FLSA. And so when we get in the future slides, you're going to see that most businesses are covered by both the South Dakota labor laws and the FLSA. And the laws sometimes have different requirements. And your question is, which ones do I apply? So we will get into that later. But the first question is, what age do you have to be to work? Um, the general rule is that you have to be about, you have to be 14 years of age to be employed. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, first off, if you're under 14, you can do things like deliver newspapers to customers, babysit, uh, work as an actor or performer in TVs, movies, radio or theater. You can work as a home worker, doing things like gathering evergreens, um, making wreaths, um, doing yard work, but that yard work must not entail using a power lawnmower. Um, the other exceptions are when the parents solely own their own business, individuals 12 and 13 years old um, can do certain types of occupations within their parents' business. The other exception is when the business is dealing with agriculture or is an agricultural-based business. Um, in that instance, individuals that are 12 and 13 year old can work in that business with their parental consent there are limitations on what that 12 and 13 year old can do, um, or they can also work on a farm where the parents work as well. And when I get into it, there's also some exception or limitations, um, what's called, what's, which is called the hazardous occupations from the US Department of Labor, and we'll delve into that deeper. So one of the questions we also get is, uh, do state and federal labor law provisions require a work permit? Um, we do not. Uh, the FLSA does not require a work permit. 
The other thing that labor laws, both on the state and federal level, do not do is limit the number of hours or when minors can work when they're 16 years or older. So when the, the minor is 16 years or older, there's no limit on how many hours that 16, 17 year old minor can work during the week or when they can work. But let's get into the 14 and 15 year olds. This is the state requirements um, for, for state laws on 14 and 15 year olds. Um, as you can see, um, they can't work any more than four hours on a school day, and that includes Fridays. Um, and you'll see an asterisk behind that. They cannot work more than 20 hours in any school week. They cannot work more than eight hours on any non-school day. And they cannot work more than 40 hours during a week when school is not in session. And that's the state. But I want you to note the two asterisks. State law is four hours on a school day, 20 hours during a school week. Federally, so if you're an employer, as you can remember, all employee, employers have to follow the state labor laws, but then employers that have $500,000 in sales or they deal in interstate commerce also have to comply with the Fair Labor Standard Act on the federal level. The federal requirements state no more than three hours on a school day, including Fridays, no more than 18 hours during a week when school's in session, and then again, no more than eight hours on a non-school day, and no more than 40 hours during a week when school's not in session. And so going back to the previous slide, you can see there's two asterisks. Well, which one, if you are an employer where you have to follow both FLSA and the state, which ones do you have to follow? The rule is you have to follow the one that is more restrictive and better for the employee. And the argument is, well, what's better for the employee is more hours of work. But the feds and state, you have to follow the, follow the one that's more restrictive, which is if you're covered by both the FLSA and the state, you have to limit the number of hours in the school day to three and no more than 18 hours during a, uh, a week when school is in session. The next question is, when can a 14 and 15 year old work? On the federal level, they can work between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. But when the time is June 1st through Labor Day, they can work from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And lastly, they can work outside school hours. So a 14 and 15 year old cannot work when school is during the school hours when school is in session, nor can they work between seven, past 7 p.m. when between June 1st and Labor Day. And when they get to June 1st and Labor Day, they can work from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So the next question, oh, well, going back to the previous slide, state law allows um, employers to have their 14 and 15 year olds work to 10 p.m. Um, on any, not after 10 p.m. on any day that precedes a school day. However, again, if you are covered by both laws, the FLSA and the state, you have to follow the federal, which is more restrictive. So a main question we get is what types of jobs can a 14 and 15 year old do? As you can see, it can be somewhat limited. Um, in the retail sector, you can see they can be cashiers and be sales individuals. They can mark prices. They can put orders together. They can do packing. They can do office and clerical work, big groceries, um, hand wash cars. And the key word there is hand wash cars. They can pump gas. They can work in fast food. And there are some limitations on working in a kitchen. Um, in fast food or in a cafe or restaurant setting. They can be dishwashers, um, but they cannot clean knives or blades from slicers. Some retail jobs to kind of specifically um, get to the, the audience today. 
These are some retail and service type jobs that 14 and 15 year olds may do. Um, they can work on intellectual or artistically creative nature. Um, what does that mean? Um, computer programming, teaching, tutoring. They can teach singing, acting, playing an instrument. They can be, they can do errands, um, delivery work, but that delivery work has to be by foot, bicycle, or public transportation. Uh, they can do cleanup work, yard work, which does not include using a power-driven mower. Um, they can work with the connection of cars and trucks, trucks such as dispensing gasoline or oil. They can hand wash, hand polish vehicles. They can do some kitchen work and food service work, including reheating food, washing dishes, cleaning equipment, and some limited cooking. Um, they, the cooking is they can cook with electric or gas grills that do not entail cooking over an open flame. Um, they can clean vegetables and fruits, do wrapping, sealing, labeling, weighing, pricing, stocking. Um, when those areas are separate from a freezer or a meat cooler, uh, they can load or unload objects for use at a work site. Um, and then there are certain areas where a 14 and 15 year old if certain requirements are met where they can work in sawmills and wood shops. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And then the last one is they can be lifeguards at swimming pools and water amusement parks. Um, but that's for 15 year olds, 14 year olds cannot. And the 15 year olds also, their other requirement is that they have to have uh, their proper certification to do that. The next question is some of the 14, some of the occupations or not so much occupations, but duties within certain occupations may they not perform. Um, and this is somewhat intuitive. Um, they can't work in manufacturing or mining. Um, they can't operate power driven equipment. Um, they can't work in transportation or communications, but there is exceptions for the next four. Um, dealing with office work. Uh, they can't work in warehousing and storage. Uh, most processing occupations, and that includes, um, you know, working in a turkey processor, chicken, meat processor, anything of that nature, except again for office or clerical, and construction and construction sites. So that's 14 and 15 year olds. The next is 16 or 17 year olds. Well, let me get to the next slide. 14 and 15 year olds also may not work in freezers and meat coolers, as I stated earlier, except they may momentarily enter a freezer to retrieve items on a, an occasional basis. So if the individual is working for a restaurant, uh, is working for a grocery store, convenience store, uh, quick shop and whatnot, they can, they can go back and grab items to, to get the inventory to then go stock the shelves in the main part but they can't stock the freezer, um, they can't you know, face the freezer or anything of that nature. Um, they cannot perform outdoor window washing when it involves work from standing on window sills. Um, they cannot work on anything requiring the use of ladders, scaffolding, or their subs. And they cannot work as a poultry catcher gathering poultry for slaughter on the market. So let's get to 16 and 17 year olds. And as, as I stated earlier, there is nothing, there is no restrictions against the hours worked, when the hours are worked for anyone older than the age of 16. And 16 and 17 year olds can do any occupation. There's no restrictions except for what's deemed the 17 hazardous occupations by the US Department of Labor and Regulation. And these are the lists <clears throat> of the 17 hazardous occupations. Um, each one um, is, in, is in very intensive of what is allowed, what is not allowed. There's a lot of interpretations of what's allowed and what's not allowed. And then there's also exceptions for when that 16 or 17 year old is part of what's called a youth apprenticeship or a student learner program. 
And so these 17 occupa hazardous occupations are prohibited. And what we kind of go into later with work comp, which we all also oversee, is there's a lot of questions from employers of, well, I'm inter interested in hiring a 16 or 17 year old to work in my manufacturing plant. And there's some power driven equipment that we use. And uh, my work comp insurance is saying I can't get coverage. Well, there's two things that go is going on there. A, that occupation might be prohibited from the onset. So it's not because the work comp carrier doesn't want to provide you coverage. It's that 16 or 17 year old actually can't perform that job duty. Secondly, if they can provide that duty, it's a business decision by the work comp carrier. And I think education with that work comp agent or the carrier, they're gonna make their underwriting decision on a case-by-case -case basis. And we'll go through that um, later on in the presentation. So as you can see, most of these hazardous occupations, for the most part, deal with the building trades, uh, construction, uh, mining industry. Um, there are some um, retail or restaurant industry, including the power driven meat slicers, processing industry, and so forth. And so what we're going to focus on <clears throat> are the hazardous occupations that most seven, 16 and 17 year olds encounter in South Dakota. And the ones that have a star beside them also have some exemptions to those prohibitions. And that's through that registered apprenticeship or student learner program. So the first one that we're gonna jump into is hazardous occupation number two, driving or outside help on, on motor vehicles. And so as you can see, um, no employee under 17 may drive a motor vehicle on public roads. So that means 16 year olds and below cannot drive a motor vehicle on public roads. However, 17 year olds can be a driver or a helper on motor vehicles on public roads under some limited circumstances. Um, those circumstances are when the driving is occasional and incidental. Um, and that means it's 20%, less than 20% of their job hours for the day. Um, they have a driver education class certification. Um, the hours are during daylight. The vehicle doesn't exceed 6,000 pounds. Um, and the driving is within 30 miles uh, of the radius of the place of employment. There is a ban on allowing 17 year olds of driving cars and trucks for delivery work. Um, they don't also don't allow the driving of cars and vehicles for route sales. Um, and also they cannot drive for towing purposes. Um, it also bans driving of golf carts, ATVs and motorcycles on public roads. Again, 17 year olds may do that. Um, 16 year olds uh, may not. Um, and there is a limited exemption again <coughs> for student apprenticeships and student learners for that. The second type of hazardous occupation that we run into is power driven woodworking machines. And so the prohibition from the US Department of Labor is that um, any type of job task that involves the operation of a power driven woodworking machine are prohibited. Um, the operation of operating power driven wood woodworking machines includes the supervising or controlling the operation of such machine, feeding the material into such machine, and helping the operator to feed material into such machines. However, this does not include the prohibition of placing material on a moving chain or in a hopper or a slide for automatic feeding. So if your power driven machine has an automatic feeder or hopper involved on the power driven machine, the 16 and 17 year old can perform that duty. 
Um, and so I think a lot of the questions that we get from the manufacturing or from the building trades is they want a list of the specific defined terms within this FLSA prohibition. And on our website, we have provided, uh, it's not exhaustive, but about a four page listing of what is allowed for a 16 or 17 year old in the type of machines that they can operate. And so sometimes we get a question, can a 16 year old or 17 year old uh, use a drill press? And on our sheet, we list, is this okay under 16? And it's checked, no. Is it okay for 16 and old, older? Yes. And obviously, is it okay for registered apprenticeships and student learners? Yes. The next question, you know, we have a full checklist. It's three pages. I, I highly advise any, anyone that's looking for if they want more specifics on what type of equipment um, is allowed or is not allowed, go to our website um, at South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation, and we have a list of all the equipment, including power-driven woodwork machines, where there's exemptions to this prohibition. The next hazardous occupation is power-driven hoisting apparatus. Um, this is a a, a prohibition where there's not any exemption for student learners and for uh, registered apprenticeships. And so anyone under the age of 18, so 16 and 17 year olds, cannot operate freight elevators, bobcat loaders, cherry pickers, boom trucks, crane, scissor lifts, lifts fork lifts. Um, I don't know if the audience today is more, this is more in tune to the audience today, but we also get a lot of questions from um, a lot of nursing home facilities, medical care provider facilities. Um, you know, there's a big movement on doing no manual lifts in the healthcare facility when there's a transfer of patients uh, from a bed. And so a lot of facilities have put in uh, mechanical lifts to help assist the patient out. It makes sense. Um, work comp injuries are usually from lifting and bending. And so the, uh, the highest amount of injuries that we see in work comp is, from, is to the back. And so facilities have, have placed these mechanical lifts, um, whether it's mandated by Medicare, by the feds or whatnot, to help provide a safer work environment for their staff. The problem is a lot of nursing home facilities uh, to build their pipeline of future nurses, whether that's CNAs, LPNs, registered nurses, they want to have younger individuals um, or individuals get into their work environment at a younger age to see if it's a career choice for them go, uh, going for the future. And of course, they're 16 and 17 years old. They're in high school working part time. And one of the big responsibilities of the job is to move patients from a bed. Unfortunately, the US Department of Labor um, has a prohibition on allowing 16 or 17 year olds to operate such mechanical hoists. They have provided new guidance where they do state in an interpretive decision that a 16 and 17 year old can assist if a, an adult is in the room when the 16 and 17 year old is operating the mechanical hoist. Um, but um, if someone is injured, they could still find a violation of the youth labor laws. Um, so basically what they're stating is we won't enforce this prohibition, but if someone is injured, we still hold and reserve the right to find a violation. And it's basically operate at your own risk. The next the hazardous occupation that we see quite a bit in South Dakota and questions is on operating power driven uh, equipment, including band saws, circular saws, guillotine shears, 
chip wood chippers, abrasive cutting disc. And so in the manufacturing, non-manufacturing, retail, wholesale services, the actual task of operating or helping out on the following power driven, whether it's fixed or portable, um, is prohibited for 16 and 17 year olds, except for again, when the machine is equipped with a full automatic feed and ejection. Um, the occupations of op operator or the helper um, of the following portable, mach portable machines of chainsaws, reciprocating saws is prohibited. But again, the student learner program or the registered apprenticeship program, there are exemptions from this prohibition. Um, I believe the South Dakota retailers have a webinar providing a copious amounts of information on the registered apprenticeship program. Um, it was provided by Rebecca Long of DLR and there's links to the retailers uh, on the retailers website. And coming up in August, uh, Secretary Marsha Holtman will also provide some additional information on the student learner program. In the hazardous occupation 15, um, the reason I have this is um, the dealing with not the ship breaking operations, but the demolition of homes or rooms within a home. Um, there's extreme prohibition against any type of teardown of a building or of a demolition of a room for 16 or 17 year olds. Again, there are some exemptions to that. And then lastly, I don't know if there's any um, roofing companies on the line today, but we get the, a lot of questions about this because there's a shortage of workers to provide labor, is that roofing occupations um, this is probably the most restrictive prohibition for 16 and 17 year olds, because as you read it, it bans all jobs in roofing operations, including work performed on the ground and all work performed on or about a roof, which means also in close proximity. Um, and when work performed in connection with the installation of roof roofs, which includes putting on flashing, applying weatherproofing materials, um, installing dish network dishes, um, installing windows around the roof, and also doing work on the ground that assists a roofer. So when a roof is being installed, employers have to be very careful about having 16 or 17 year olds, even on the work site, um, and it's a very restrictive prohibition. However, U.S. Department of Labor and OSHA, um, there's a lot of stats where the highest amount of injuries that occur for minors on a national level um, deal with uh, work on or about a roof. It's typically the most dangerous part of the construction of a, of a, a building or a house or a residence. The next, Prohibition is excavation um, is prohibited. Um, however, manual excavating for 16 and 17 year olds or backfilling of trenches that do not exceed four feet in depth at any point are allowed. Um, and then they also can work within a trench that does not exceed four feet in depth at any point. So the prohibition here is if you have a 16 or 17 year old, they can manually work in a trench that's less than four feet in depth. They can, they can also excavate manually or backfill a trench that's no more than four feet in depth. Again, there is an exemption for student learners and apprenticeships. Um, as I stated, um, a couple links, this is a, uh, Department of Labor and Regulation resources on our youth apprenticeships, um, and it's called Start Today SD. Uh, retailers do have a presentation um, that's uh, bookmarked on their website, but here's a link to our website, DLR, for some resources for employers um, as well. Uh, the Department of Ed 
is doing the student learner program. And then, as I stated earlier, for manufacturing and construction equipment, and also for retail food industry, including restaurants or grocery stores or sea shops, um, we have a list of equipment, again, it's non-exhaustive, of what is allowed, what isn't allowed, and what exemptions are there for that specific equipment uh, within manufacturing and construction. And so I advise you uh, to go to those links um, to get more information to help you uh, make decisions on what types of tasks you would have your 16, 17 year olds uh, perform and then also your 14 or 15 year olds in some limited circumstances. So next, we'll talk about very briefly on the apprenticeship and a little bit more on the student learner program. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, again, this is federal, allows youth who are 16 and 17 year olds to work in any occupation. However, it is limited to the 17 hazardous occupations that they feel is detrimental to youth health or welfare. And then within those 17 hazardous occupations, there is some limited exemptions where it's part where the youth and the business are part of a qualified apprenticeship or student learner program. And so um, again, um, we had the registered apprenticeship webinar was on April 11th, 2018. Um, the recording, which is on YouTube, again, this is a link that retailers provided. And then the PowerPoints um, on the South Dakota Retails, Retailers Association website, going over the apprenticeship qualifications and the exceptions for 16 and 17 year olds from the hazardous occupations um, as deemed by US Department of Labor and Regulation. So the student learner qualifications, and it, it doesn't apply to all 17, it applies to about six of the 17, but for a student learner qualification for the exemption from those six hazardous occupations, the student learner program has to meet the following criteria. And it's the youth must be enrolled in a course of study and training in a cooperative vocational training program under recognized state or local educational authority or in a course of study in a substantially similar program conducted by a private school. So what does that mean? And so you, uh, South Dakota Department of Ed oversees our K through 12 system in South Dakota and also oversees the tech schools, um, which does have their own post-secondary board now, um, last year was formed. But in the K through 12 schools, it's the career technical education, uh, the tech programs that are within the K through 12 system in South Dakota. And if they have a vocational program, uh, for Peter, for instance, I believe we have a culinary program um, that started in the last couple of years. Um, there's some diesel mechanics, uh, there's uh, some building trade programs in our K through 12 system. So if those 16 or 17 year olds, and remember it's 16 or 17 year olds, if that student is 18, these prohibitions don't apply. It's for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, if those 16 or 17 year olds are part of a program that is approved by the South Dakota Department of Education, which is provided by the school, local school district, and then the youth is employed under a written agreement, which provides that the hazardous work performed by the student learner is incidental to his training, which means the program that he's in the school getting education and the performance of his job offsite in the business are tied. There's a close, you know, it's not, I'm in a, a culinary trade education program, but I'm doing my on the job training in building trades. That would not be incidental. The particularly hazardous work is intermittent and for short periods of time. What that means is it is not more than 20% of that student's work day. And so they can't be performing that hazardous occupation for the entire day. They can only do it for up to 20% of their day to get more training. And again, keep in mind there's, there's other things that 
that the 16 and 17 year old can do, it's more about the specific tasks that are prohibited. The next requirement is that the hazardous work is performed under the direct and close supervision of a qualified and experienced person, which makes sense. Um, I think that's a requirement that's a win-win for the businesses as well, that they have someone properly train the youth um, when they're doing that hazardous portion of their occupation. Um, safety instructions are provided by the school and correlated by the employer with the on-job training. And so again, that's the school and the employer working together to ensure that the youth has some safety instruction on how to operate the equipment. And then there's a schedule of organized and progressive work processes to perform by the youth on the job have been prepared. And that's just kind of a, a study plan or a plan to show, okay, this week we're going to train them on X. Next week we're gonna train them on Y. And then to kind of show that the schooling that they're getting in the tech program and the on-the-job training are still correlated and moving forward to get that youth fully trained to, to perform the occupation. What does a student learner agreement need to have? It's pretty cut and dry. I believe it's about a half page document is all that's required by the Department of Ed. It's the name of the student learner, it's signed by the employer and the school district coordinator or the principal of the school. Both the school and the employer keep copies of the agreement. Um, the student learner exception may be revoked by, at any time. Um, and then lastly, a high school graduate may be employed in any occupation in which he has completed training as provided in this paragraph as a student learner, even though he's not 18 years of age, and that should be he or she. And so what does that mean? Again, remember, if I'm a student and I turn 18, none of these prohibitions apply. But let's say I'm a student and I'm 17, I'm in a student learner program, and I turn and I graduate, before I turn 18, I don't have to then stop doing what I'm doing. The prohibitions, none of them apply anymore. And even though I'm not 18, because I've completed a student learner program through a school district and an employer, I can hit the ground running um, before my 18th birthday. The next big question that we get um, is how does work comp insurance um, come into play and who pays for it, who's responsible for it, and probably most importantly from the employer side is how do I discuss it with my agent to ensure that if I'm doing a student learner program or for any youth, um, I can get work comp insurance uh, for my employees. Um, just a little bit about work comp, and I'm, I'm sure most of everyone here knows about it, but it's always good to remind. Work comp insurance is a private insurance system. Uh, employers go out to an agent, insurance underwriter, um, and pay premium to the company they choose. Um, if they cannot get it on the voluntary market, um, some employers have to go to the assigned risk pool. And the benefits paid for the workers, it's the grand bargain that was determined back in the 19, early 1900s um, is that Injured workers get what's called indemnity or disability lost time payments and their medical costs are covered. Um, and, and the grand bargain was it's an insurance program. So if an, an injured worker is injured on the job, the employer has work comp, the injured worker can't sue the employer for multi-millions of dollars in tort. There's a specific system they have to go through, the injured employer has, employee has to go through that sets what they can re, uh, be granted in benefits for their disability and what medical costs are or not covered. It's not an entitlement. Um, it's not health insurance for life. It's specifically for when that injury arises out of or in course of employment for the injured worker. One thing that a lot of employers don't realize um, is that there's no specific state law that states that employers have to have it. Um, however, 
it's highly, highly, highly advisable not to have it. Um, again, if you have it, there's a specific process. Damages are limited to the employee of what they can get. If you don't have work comp insurance, an employer is injured on the job, they can sue you in civil court and damages are not limited. Um, attorney fees can be earned by the uh, injured employee and it's gonna be much more um, costly to the employer if they don't have it. So we don't advise employers to not have work comp insurance. Now I don't know if there's any AG employers on the phone here, but there are some exemptions of where coverage is or isn't required. In South Dakota, AG employment, um, and that is not per se an AG elevator, but let's say uh, planting the traditional methods of our businesses that deal with AG, um, there is a work comp exemption from having, uh, have, having to pay for injuries when it's based upon AG employment. Again, like I said, um, it only applies if there's an injury on the job. Whether you get work comp insurance or not, um, it's a business decision by the insurance company. Um, you have your own, um, based upon your code, um, a base rate, and then you have your experience rating um, that's individual to each entity on what your premiums are going to be on a yearly basis. One of the things that we heard was a lot of employers are like, well, yeah, we'd like to maybe do a youth apprenticeship or do a student learner, but my work comp agent is saying we're not going to provide coverage for anyone under the age of 18. So that's a little bit of, of fiction. Um, and it was kind of a myth that was going out there. What was happening was actually individuals were wanting to hire 16 and 17 year olds, maybe to be a roofer, uh, maybe to drive a forklift um, or perform some of the hazardous occupations where there wasn't any exemptions. And so it wasn't so much that the work comp carrier, the agent was saying, we won't provide you coverage it was, we can't provide coverage because of the prohibitions from the youth performing those jobs. And so we've done some education uh, with the work comp carriers in South Dakota on what is prohibited by U.S. Department of Labor, FLSA. Um, and it will come down to, when we discuss it with the work comp carriers, is that they're typically not aware because they don't ask for age on the underwriting application unless the individual is under the age of 16 or over the age of 60. It's more of a case by case basis um, on whether they do provide that coverage or not. Um, and so what's happened is there's the availability of work comp coverage is often confused with the limitations that are created by the prohibitions under the federal youth labor laws. Um, and again, we want employers to know that they should not dismiss, you know, registered apprenticeship opportunities for youth, work-based learning experiences for youth, um, the student learner program, based solely on concerns regarding work comp coverage. Um, if employers are interested in the student learner or registered apprenticeship for youth for non-hazardous occupations, you should have minimal work comp coverage concerns and easily obtain the coverage. Um, coverage for hazardous occupations is obtainable, but there's a little more legwork um, that you have to discuss with your work comp insurance carrier. Um, and I'd like to you know, leave some time here for Q&A. Um, and again, this is our contact information. This is our direct line for workforce training, which deals with the registered apprenticeship and can answer some questions on student learner. This is our line to the Division of Labor and Management. And again, we have a labor law FAQ, another resource for employers 
Um, it's a four-page FAQ, um, and that's a link to that to help answer any questions that you still may have. Um, but we're here to help. We're here to provide guidance. Um, and so I will now open it up to questions and answers. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, as, as he said, we'll open it up for questions. If you want to ask a question, go to the panel on the right side of your screen. Um, and you may need to click that orange arrow to maximize it. You can type your message into the chat box and click on send, and then I will read the questions and Tom can provide the answers. Um, if there's something that needs a little more research, we will send that out. We'll have, Tom will get the information and then we will send that out later. Uh, before I, I did have one question that came in. Where do you find the chart on the labor and regulation website for what the 16 and 17 year olds can and cannot do? Um, that was sent in before we got to the slide, but slide 22 has that website. I think is the one that you were referring to um, that has the checklist of what 16 and 17 year olds can and cannot do. Yep, titled ex exceptions and exemptions. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so let's get started with the questions here. The first one is regarding the opportunity wage for new employees. Does an employer have to pay exactly four twenty-five an hour for the first ninety calendar days, or is that a minimum? Good question. That is a minimum. Um, they can pay an opportunity wage um, when the employee is under the age of twenty. So when they turn 20, they can no longer do that, and they can only pay that opportunity wage within the first 90 calendar days of employment, and they can only do that once. Um, so if an employee starts on January 1 and works 10 days in January, 5 days in February, doesn't work in March, uh, um, February is short 30 days, but let's say March 30th is the 90 days, but the employees only worked 15 days, you can no longer pay them that opportunity wage of 4.25 an hour. They now have to be paid 8.85 an hour because we're all South Dakota employers, so the state minimum wage applies, which is higher than federal. But if they're in a tipped employee, you can pay them 50% and then get a requ uh, request a tip credit. And then as long as their tips, take them up to 885 an hour, um, the employer is compliant with the law. Okay, thank you. And that's so the second part of the question then was the age of the employees, what, does, what age does that apply to? And I think he answered that person's yeah. under, under the age of 20. So um, 19, I mean, it's not 19 and under, it's under the age of 20. And it's, so it's not 20 and under either. So on the day they turn 20, it's gone. Okay. How, this one's kind of an, um, a specific one, but what's the age, what age does a teen have to be to make an espresso drink or other, some other coffee type drink? Sure. Well, as we, we kind of go back, 14 and 15 year olds, um, obviously 16 year olds can, can perform that because 16 year olds um, can do anything that is not in the 17 hazardous occupations as deemed by US DOL. And so for four, and then 14 year olds um, is typically the, the age where employee, the minimum age where employees can work. And so the question is, um, whether that is limited within what a 14 or 15 year old can do. Um, a 14 or 15 year old can work and do certain things like reheating, cooking of food where there's a non-electric or gas grill in an open flame. Um, I don't know how specifically or how the espresso machine is constructed if it's, um, you know, a, a mechanical one that where there's not, you know, steam being produced. Um, I would believe that a 14 year old can be a barista and make an, uh, an espresso or espresso. Um, I know in Montana that 14 year olds can work at Starbucks at a barista. So I would say probably 14 years old. Um, I can see if there's anything within US DOL, DOL guidance that provides more interpretive 
of what if it's if it gets down to dependent on how the machine is manufactured if that makes sense mm -hmm. but i would say 14 years old okay um we just had another question that came in regarding that the tip credit and how that fits in with the opportunity wage can an employer pay a tipped employee half of the four dollar and twenty five cents an hour training wage for their first ninety days, or do you no. have half of the minimum wage regardless of the age? Yeah, if you're gonna if you're an employer and you want to do the tip credit, you have to pay fifty percent of the state minimum wage, which is four forty two and a half. Um, if you want to do the opportunity wage, you can pay down to four twenty five. Um, you can't um, do half of 425 to get the tip credit. So you couldn't pay a tipped employee two dollars and twelve and a half cents, and then do a tip credit for that other two dollars and twelve and a half cents. Okay. Can they? Can you pay them the 425 and still do the mm -hmm. tip credit, or do you have to, do you have to do the 442? And yeah. Half? Yeah, I mean, you can pay any employee that's under the age of 20 for the first 90 calendar days of employment down to $4.25. And then if you get the tip credit... Um, well, you don't, I mean, you don't even have to do the tip credit. I mean, if, oh, okay. if you're paying them the opportunity wage, you're paying them four twenty five an hour. But let's say um, I'm 20 years old and it's a tipped employee where they make $30 or more a month. And tips, I could pay them four forty two and a half, and then uh, get the tip credit up to eight eighty five. And again, if their tips do not take them up to eight eighty five an hour, you have to make up the difference for the between the tips, the four forty two and a half, and the eight eighty five. But let's say I'm nineteen year old and I am a server that gets tips. You can pay them four twenty five an hour um, but again, um if they get tips, they get to keep that though, but it, let's say their tips only take them up to seven bucks an hour. You're fine because I'm nineteen it's my first ninety day calendar days of work, and I paid the opportunity wage of four twenty five an hour okay, if that Thank makes you. sense yep uh, this one kind of goes back to the hours that 14 and 15 year olds may work um, and the, including Friday so you had talked about Friday is not in the week is not a weekend day so does that uh, count if you don't have school on that Friday uh, when school is in session or on a work on a non school day so Friday is um, Friday is not in session then they could work no more than eight hours on a non-school day. Okay, so the it, the including Friday yeah. is only if you have school on that Friday. Correct, and so, because what we get a question a lot is, it's Friday um, and school got out at three, three o'clock and they don't have school on Saturday, right? Because it's a weekend. Um, can they work five until, can they work until 9 or 7 p.m. that night? So can they work four hours that night after school? And no, they can't because they can only work three hours on a day when school is in session. Okay. Even though there's no school the next day. Does that make sense? Yep. So I have a couple questions here um, regarding ag-related businesses. Is dog breeding or pheasant farm, those type of businesses, are those considered ag related? So there's not a, a clear definition, uh, but the courts have given us some interpretive um, precedent. And when we deal with, uh, for work comp purposes or for any exemptions from ag, um, it's the traditional ideas of ag, which is planting, um, harvesting, harvesting of grain, um, dog breeding, and pheasant farm, uh, pheasant farming, or raising of, of pheasants, 
would not fall within that AG exemption for AG from work comp or from the U.S. Department of Labor uh, prohibitions. Okay. This one um, we might have touched on, but a teller for a company for, for a business, how old does the minor have to be to be a teller? And, uh, I, and I, I'm going to kind of ask a question to the question. A teller by mean like a bank teller or a ticket counter or anything like that? I mean, they can be a, a cashier. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything in regards to U.S. Department of Labor if they're a teller taking money um, of that nature. Um, office and clerical work is allowed. Um, and so... So would that, that would include a bank teller then? I think that would include, yes, I would say that that would include a bank teller. I have one regarding minimum wage. Um, I started a 14 year old at 720 an hour. So to be clear, in 90 days, I need to raise that wage to 885. Is that correct? If they're non-tipped, if they're if they're non-tipped, um, you'd have to raise that to 885 per hour. Um, and le and let me go because South Dakota apply law applies to everyone. The minimum wage for federal is seven and a quarter or 720. But if it's a South Dakota employer, they have to pay 885. If it's a tipped employee, you can pay down to as low as 442 and a half, and then their tips just have to take them up to 885 an hour. Okay, thank you. And this one, this one might be a little specific, um, but if I own a construction company, can my son work for me on job sites? And if so, what can he do on those job sites? Is he still restricted by the 14 and 15 year old? restrictions? Yeah, there's there's some there's some things that 14 and 15 year olds um, and 16 and 17 year olds can do when the business is solely owned for their parents. Um, and if I could get them some, I can get some more detailed information in regards to that following this uh, presentation today. Um, um, so if you could get whoever that re requires that, I can send that out. Okay, yes, we can do that. And I think maybe we can wait a couple more seconds, but I think that is all the questions that I have seen here. No one else has any more questions. I think that will wrap up today's webinar. But so, yep, I'll, I think so. So again, I want to um, thank you, Tom, and the South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation for the presentation. Uh, just as a note, this webinar was recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed to you later today. And uh, just before we conclude, I'd like to let you know of two other upcoming educational opportunities that we have. On June 28th, we'll be presenting a free webinar on South Dakota's new data breach reporting law that will go into effect on July 1st. And then on August 1st, we'll once again partner with the Department of Labor and Regulation to present a webinar on youth in the workforce with ideas on how to recruit, manage, and engage young people in the workforce. So to uh, register for those, you can check out our website at www.sdra.org, and we'll also include links to the webinar, this webinar recording on there as well. Thanks again to everyone for participating in today's program.